So there are really two halves to this talk. There are, there's work on singlet spin valves, and that's been done by several PhD students shown on the left there. And then um, essentially the work on the right is to do with triplet spin valves and uh, the interactions that, that can generate triplet pairs in the heterostructures that we're talking about. So um, all of the structures I'm going to talk about are obviously metallic uh, multilayers of, of one sort or another. And the first historically to be investigated was uh, what's now being called a singlet spin valve or singlet spin switch. And the simplest of these is simply uh, two ferromagnetic layers with a superconductor layer in between. And uh, depending on whether these layers are parallel or anti-parallel, you either generate uh, an addition of the exchange field within the ferromagnets or a partial cancellation. So you, you expect to be able to get a critical temperature difference between those two states. But as I've noted down here, a key aspect of these is that you have quite a strong proximity effect, which is also tending to depress the critical temperature, regardless of the spin orientation of the ferromagnet. So the electrons, the pairs of electrons wander all over the system, meaning that the critical temperature is depressed and the measured change in the critical temperature is actually really pretty small for most of these devices. So uh, a few years ago, we decided to explore the potential for using rare earth ferromagnets in, in such a system, not least because the, 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 the potential transparency of the um, uh, rare earth to, to superconductor interface is, is probably quite small because they're rather b poorly band matched systems. So these are epitaxial systems and although this is holmium, which has been talked about in, in many of the talks previously as, as having this, this spiral magnetism, you can turn that off if it's an epitaxial system. So these are epitaxial films. This is the magnetization curve of an epitaxial holmium film. As grown, it does have this spiral structure so that it has zero net moment. But if you apply a large field of about half a tesla, you then switch it irreversibly into a ferromagnetic state. So you can switch the, then switch the magnetism as if it was a conventional ferromagnet. It is a conventional ferromagnet. All the spins are aligned, and they're obviously aligned with the applied field. So you get a square hysteresis loop with, with a large remnants and quite a large coercivity. So we turned these uh, sorts of devices into uh, spin valves. So you've now got two holmium layers with different thicknesses and so different coercivities. And so there's then a region here where there is some degree of anti-parallel alignment of the two magnetic layers. And uh, so we're switching between those two states and looking hopefully, for uh, a significant change in the, in the critical temperature. So this is uh, the experimental result. So this is a, a plot of the critical temperature of these structures versus applied magnetic field. And you can see, to start with, the critical temperature is quite high. That's because the as-grown holmium is in the spiral state, so it's not magnetic at all, or not ferromagnetic at all. Then you apply enough field to switch it into the, into the parallel state, parallel ferromagnetic state, so the critical temperature is then at its minimum because you have the addition of the, of the exchange fields. And then you can go through a reversible hysteretic cycle where you go between the parallel and anti-parallel states. And the, the, change, the size of the changes you get with, with these materials is actually quite significant. So these are the uh, uh, RT curves for both the as-grown, the and parallel and the anti-parallel state. And you can see there's about half a Kelvin shift in the, the critical temperature, which is considerably larger than, than has been achieved with transition metal systems, so cobalt, permalloy, and so on. So that's, that's an improvement. Uh, it's, if you choose exactly the right temperature, you can achieve uh, infinite magnetoresistance. So in other words, you can switch between a state which has zero resistance and something which has finite resistance. Uh, so you've got a, a device which potentially, if you could design your, your system to operate at a precisely controlled temperature, could do something useful for you electronically. But it's a restricted temperature range, 
and it's restricted largely because there's obviously a degree of proximity effect still present I in that system. So we then turned our attention to, to using ferromagnetic insulators as uh, the, the material which produces the exchange field. And now the electrons obviously don't enter the, the, the ferromagnet, so it's the surface exchange field which is the thing which is driving the, uh, the superconducting state. So the electrons just rattle around in the superconductor, they pick up the, the exchange field at, at, at each interface, and so now you've got a system where you've got addition here, you've got at least partial but, but pretty good cancellation of uh, those exchange fields if the superconductor is, is thin enough. And crucially, you have no proximity effect, so you should get significantly larger effects. And we weren't the first people to look at this, so this is um, uh, Mudira's work um, with Euro the standard europium sulphide aluminium system. So at low temperatures, and again, choosing the right temperature, you, you have this infinite magnetoresistance. Um, but we have chosen for, for a number of years to work with this gadolinium nitride ferromagnetic insulator. So uh, these are some of our initial uh, uh, studies of this material. It's, it has a comparable Curie temperature to uh, europium sulphide, but it can be grown uh, very nicely with niobium nitride, so a comparatively high temperature superconductor. So these were our initial studies of the material just as a material. We then made uh, superconducting junctions. This is a Josephson junction with a gadolinium nitride barrier. This is therefore a spin filter Josephson junction, uh, which has a number of interesting properties, which I'm not going to cover in this talk. Um, but these are the, the spin valve devices. So in fact, we use niobium rather than niobium nitride. And although I wasn't here, I think um, Jagadish Madeira covered uh, his experiments with this system uh, on Monday. But uh, these are our results. So uh, what we're doing is, is obviously switching again between parallel and anti-parallel orientation of the gadolinium nitride. The layers are slightly different in thickness. But there are several interesting features about this. First of all, if you look at these magnetization loops, <coughs> <coughs> These, <coughs> these are at temperatures um, above the, the, the niobium critical temperature. You can actually see there's, there's not very much evidence of a difference in the coercivity of the two layers. And it's only really when you approach the critical temperature do you start to see the step which corresponds to the anti-parallel configuration. Then when you're in the superconducting state or, or, or starting to enter it, you, you again get this infinite magnetoresistance is now present over quite a wide field range and uh, you have a coercivity which then starts to increase quite rapidly once you're in this uh, superconducting region. So uh, this is, uh, as with uh, the, the previous uh, work with, with the, the Holmium, we've now got a big difference between the anti-parallel and parallel configurations which is now nearly a Kelvin in this, in this system. Uh, so we get big delta TC values and the, the significance of, of what I'm about to say is that there are lots of ways in which you can manipulate magnetism to, to control superconductivity and there, there have been several examples in, in previous talks. So this is uh, Norman Burge's work on the, the triplet uh, junctions, this is our um, spin valve work and these are the sorts of spin valve Joseph's injunction, which we talked about yesterday. So uh, all of those are things where you're applying a field, you're manipulating the magnetism, and somehow the superconductivity is going to respond to that. What you really want is some method by which the superconductivity can control the magnetism, because then you've got a closed system, you can start to, to design circuits which might be able to exploit uh, the interactions. So um, we focused on this behaviour and in particular the emergence of this, this second coercive field and its fairly rapid increase when you hit the superconducting state. And essentially what we did with a whole series of samples was to plot the temperature dependence of these two coercive fields um, for different thicknesses. So we've got 
samples with different niobium spacer thicknesses, as you make the spacer thickness fit smaller, the TC obviously goes down, but the change in TC between parallel and antiparallel starts to go up very quickly. So here are the, the curves for parallel and antiparallel for 16, 12, 10 and 8 nanometers. So it goes up quickly. And then what's plotted on this diagram are the two different coercive fields as the open and closed symbols for uh, the material as they come down in temperature. And the key feature is that once you hit the region where the superconductivity starts, this second coercive field starts to increase very rapidly. So what that's saying is that you're tending to stabilize um, the anti-parallel state once superconductivity appears in the system. And <coughs> the theory for this was originally worked out in the 60s by De Gen. Um, so uh, it's based on the superconducting condensation energy, which in turn is dependent on, on the gap of the system. So at a temperature some way below the critical temperature, you have a temperature dependent gap. And so that gap then enters into the condensation energy. So the superconducting condensation energy of the system then depends on whether the magnetism in the two layers is parallel or anti-parallel. So changing that magnetic orientation changes the, the <coughs> condensation energy. You're changing the, a term in the free energy of the system. And so it's providing an effective exchange coupling between those ferromagnetic insulators. <coughs> and so essentially this is the, the low energy state. It, is, um, uh, it has a low EC, so that's, that's the parallel state. Uh, it has a high condensation energy for the anti-parallel state. The condensation energies are negative, therefore this tends to be the energetically favorable state. So you can, you can re-express that. So this uh, exchange energy term can be turned into this equation here. It's dependent on the magnitude of delta Tc. So as delta Tc goes up with the thickness going down, you'd expect this exchange uh, energy term and hence the coercive field to go up much more rapidly. So you can see as you go through each of these transitions for the different thicknesses, the size of the effect progressively increases. And the significance of this is that Conventional spintronics is, is founded on a number of uh, exchange interactions. So there's exchange bias between an antiferromagnet and a ferromagnet, RKKY and Neal coupling. And our argument is that <coughs> this is another form of superconducting exchange coupling. <coughs> and uh, so this stabilizes an anti-parallel state. And this was reported earlier this, this year. And the key thing about it is that this is potentially controllable. If we can manipulate the superconductivity in some way, we can then manipulate the magnetism in a, in a way which doesn't require external fields to be applied. So, so that's essentially the first half of my talk. That's been dealing with singlet effects. The magnetism in these systems has either been parallel or anti-parallel. And... Uh, as we know from, from most of the talks uh, yesterday, what uh, to, to generate triplet effects, you need non-collinear magnetism. And generally speaking, the, the effects are optimized when you have orthogonal magnetization of adjacent layers. So here's a, a, some earlier work that, that Jason Robinson led. So um, here we've got uh, cobalt permalloy layers close to an, an ibium layer and essentially because the permalloy follows the applied magnetization by changing the angle that you're applying the magnetic field you can get a dependence of the critical temperature uh, as a function of the angle which gives a minimum at 90 degrees which corresponds to the maximum of the triplet proximity effect so in other words you're forming spin aligned triplet pairs those can penetrate more easily into the cobalt layer and hence increase the proximity-induced depression of the critical temperature in the niobium. So this is the sort of fundamental principle of the triplet spin valve. You're controlling the critical temperature by opening or closing a triplet proximity channel uh, for the 
pairs to, to leak away into. So uh, this has been developed uh, into uh, much more impressive changes in, in critical temperature by Jan Arts using the, the chromium oxide system. So using this structure here, he got changes uh, above a Kelvin. Uh, the key thing here is that whereas this previous experiment involved in-plane fields and in-plane magnetizations, the large changes here could only be achieved by uh, essentially applying out-of-plane magnetic fields to produce the, the misorientation of the two magnetic layers. So uh, uh, we wanted to, to try and replicate that experiment using conventional ferromagnets. So this is our version of that experiment. So it uses niobium nickel uh, copper spacer and then a, a thick cobalt uh, spin sink layer. So this is uh, the basis of the experiment. So these are the hysteresis loops of the individual layers. This is our thick cobalt layer, which uh, has a largely in-plane uh, orientation. But the outer plane loop shows that there is uh, some remnants in the outer plane direction, which is probably because it's, it, it is uh, strongly textured, uh, 11100 textured. So it will tend to, to, to grow uh, outer plane. It will tend to have at least some component of outer plane magnetization. The nickel, on the other hand, does what you expect a, a thin magnetic film to do. It has uh, a hard axis behavior and zero remnants for, for the outer plane direction. So as uh, Jan has, has carefully argued in, in his paper, if you start applying out of plane fields to devices like this, you're doing a number of things, all of which are tending to suppress superconductivity. You're applying a, an out of plane field, so the, the, that will directly reduce your critical temperature. You're also, if there's a magnetic layer, you're tending to drive the flux from that magnetic layer also through the superconductor. So you're generating effectively an additional flux due to the, the rotation of the magnetic layers. So there are a whole series of things to be subtracted before you can actually start to see uh, the result that you might be looking for. So here's, here's the experiment. So we've got either uh, a niobium and thick cobalt control sample, which is uh, the blue curves yeah, on, on this plot here, or we've got our triplet spin valve, and this purple layer here is, is then the nickel with a copper spacer. So uh, here we've got the, the raw uh, RT curves, firstly at, at zero field and then at, at half a Tesla. And then this, this plot here shows how the critical temperature is then dependent on magnetic field. And the open symbols here for, are for in-plane fields. And as you might expect, the, the rate of change of the critical temperature is quite small because the, the thin niobium is, uh, is not too sensitive to that. But out of plane, you get a pretty rapid drop of the critical temperature with applied field. And that is a combination of the applied field and the large intrinsic magnetization of the uh, cobalt being directed into the niobium film. So that's, that's the data. What we've done here is then to normalize the critical temperatures, so T over Tc, naught, uh, for the two different materials for in, for in plane and out of plane behavior as shown here. And the key thing is that this curve here, these two curves for the two different layer structures are not quite the same. So you can see that in this region here, there's uh, the red is a bit lower than the blue, whereas at, at low fields, the opposite is true. So you then take that data, you subtract one of those from the other because your control sample is hopefully including all of the effects of the applied field and the flux due to the, the cobalt. And so what you're left with should be the, the sort of triplet effect that you're looking for. So what's plotted here, this is the data points. These are the the differences between those two curves, uh, which uh, go through uh, a, a sharp uh, minimum here, then rise up and gradually decay away uh, as you apply higher and higher fields. So 
to interpret this, you, we, we went back to the original magnetization curves, which are the ones shown here. You can relate that, if you assume that these, these magnetic layers behave in a reasonably coherent way, you can assign a magnetization angle for each of those layers, so sine theta is just given by the magnetization divided by the saturation magnetization. The cobalt has a remnant, uh, and, but then a fairly linear rise, so that's, that's, this is the, the result from extracted from the cobalt magnetization loop. The nickel has no remnants, so theta is, is zero at zero field, and then it goes through a fairly standard hard axis behavior. So from that, you can work out uh, that the, the relative angles of those two magnetic layers changes as a function of applied field. And in particular, there is a field at which they're essentially parallel. But that is not zero field. You need a small field uh, to tilt the, the nickel out of plane to make it parallel to the average direction of the cobalt. And if we then assume that the triplet proximity effect is, is dependent on the, the difference of the, s the sign of the difference of those angles, uh, which is what the, the standard theories would suggest, then you can calculate this, this function p as just being proportional to sine delta theta. And so you can show that there's, there's pretty good qualitative agreement between the form of that curve and uh, the, the, the response. So that's the good news. So I think we, we understand this. That the less good news is that the, that's when you translate this back into, into absolute changes of TC, they're still pretty small. They're still tens of millikelvin, not the Kelvin or so that, that Jan Arts saw with the chromium dioxide. So uh, for that reason, again, the, the transition metals appear to be uh, less than ideal for this, this sort of application. So the, the final thing I'm going to talk about is this is unpublished work uh, done by uh, Niladri Banerjee. Well, he was a postdoc of mine before he left to, to work for Loughborough. And we've collaborated with the, the Trondheim uh, theory group in, in trying to understand behaviour. So this is somewhat different. This is, although the, the response is in many ways like the, the previous system that I've been talking about, this, this is a system with only one magnetic layer. And instead of uh, relying on the misorientation of magnetic layers, it's now a system which involves uh, spin orbit effects uh, to generate or not generate uh, triplet uh, correlations. So here, this is the structure. We've, we've got the niobium. We've, uh, this is a control sample, so ni we've got niobium, cobalt, platinum. Uh, and the platinum in this is, this is really simply to, to protect the surface of the, of the, uh, of the cobalt. And then the, the alternative structure is we insert a layer of platinum between the uh, niobium and the cobalt. And this is the, the, the system which then has a structural inversion symmetry and creates a, a degree of, of spin orbit coupling. So we have one magnetic layer, but we can change its angle by applying a field. So it's to that extent somewhat similar to, to the previous set of experiments, where again we're applying uh, an out of plane magnetic field because it's the, it's the relationship of that angle to the uh, movement of the electrons that's important. So an in-plane uh, reorientation is, is meaningless. So we have a whole series of control samples, and uh, you need to t look at these all together to, to see what the, the changes are that are taking place. So we've got a control sample with no magnetic layer. We've got one with no, without the platinum spacer layer, which we believe is crucial. And then this final one, which is the complete structure, which is niobium, platinum, cobalt, platinum. And in each case, we, we do the experiment of applying a field out of plane, which are these red points here. You can see that the critical temperature change, again, is quite rapid for the reasons I explained before. If you apply the magnetic field in plane, this is quite a small field range. You'd actually wouldn't expect much change at all in, in the uh, uh, critical temperature. There is some, and it's a bit more than the noise level. And the key result, which uh, I'll analyze in a somewhat qualitative way at the moment, is that this sample here shows a fast decrease with applied field, 
faster than this sample here. And the increased rate of decrease here is because of the excess flux, which is being drawn into the niobium by the applied field as you uh, increase uh, the, the applied field. On the other hand, this sample, which has exactly the same amount of cobalt and the same sort of magnetic response, is now a much slower decrease. So that's, that's the key result. There is also a difference between the in-plane behaviour. You get uh, a rather slow decrease, if there's any change at all, in-plane for this sample, whereas you get a somewhat faster one when you uh, apply uh, an in-plane field when you've got this, this platinum spacer layer. So it's this structural inversion symmetry which uh, is present in this sample and, and not here. And the triplet pairing components appear or disappear depending on the relative orientation of uh, the surface and uh, the applied magnetization or degenerated magnetization. So the key thing is, is this angle theta. As you apply um, uh, a magnetic field in plane, you tend to decrease theta because, again, there's a small natural outer plane orientation remnants in the material, in the cobalt, as there was in the other system. If you um, uh, apply the system outer plane, uh, then you, you increase theta. And what's plotted here is the difference of TC between the control sample and the niobium platinum cobalt platinum sample. So in one case, that decreases as you uh, change the angle. In the other case, it increases as you change the angle. And what you're doing, again, is closing the triplet proximity channel as you increase theta. So you're restricting the number of pairs which are able to leak away from the, the superconductor. And so the TC tends to rise as you do that. So this is uh, the, the end result. So essentially, uh, for this sample here, the, the spin orbit coupling reduces the TC, and it reduces it more as you make the, the cobalt magnetization lie more in plane. If you apply a, an outer plane field, the spin orbit coupling uh, tends to decrease because you're increasing the angle of the cobalt with respect to that plane. The cobalt flux behavior is the same for both of these samples. So that's the thing that's been subtracted from our analysis. And the key thing is that the presence of this platinum spacer changes the behavior. OK, so I'm um, reaching my conclusions. And my voice is reaching the end of its tether. <coughs> Um, it's about 18 nanometers, I think. It's some, I mean, it's chosen that to get a, a proximity induced change. Right. So, does it have an exoplanet by itself? So, with respect to the directions, parallel Oh yeah, yes. I mean, intrinsically, it will have a much. It will be much more responsive to. I mean, you you can see that if you. Um, if you look at the, this behavior here, this sample doesn't have any cobalt. So this is just niobium platinum. So an in-plane field produces all, very little change to uh, the, the critical temperature. An outer-plane field changes it quite, the, you can see the field ranges are quite different in that case. So it's just, it's just the usual argument that a thin, thin superconducting film is, is unresponsive in-plane uh, for those field ranges. OK, so uh, my conclusions. Um, so the summary, we've, we've seen infinite magnetoresistance in these um, holmium niobium holmium spin valves, uh, even larger delta TCs in the uh, uh, rare earth nitride system. That has, in turn, given us superconducting control of the magnetic state, which uh, we like to believe is a key potential ingredient for for super spintronics. Um, we've demonstrated um, that, uh, albeit again in a rather inconvenient geometry, that uh, you can uh, 
change the nature of the triplet proximity effect by some sort of spin orbit effect. This is a system with, with only one magnetic layer, so it can't be any magnetic misorientation uh, mechanism. Uh, and then finally, the, the stuff I haven't talked about, which um, Kunrock Gion talked about on, on Monday. So uh, this, this, this measurement, which suggests that uh, for the right set of parameters, we can get uh, an enhanced spin transport in the superconducting state, um, which appears to be uh, an a new mechanism, which again is uh, potentially a key ingredient for uh, a, a connected superconducting spintronic system. Okay, so I'll stop there.